Great. Well, welcome everyone to our session this afternoon. Um, lessons from the community, what I've learned as an OpenStack Days organizer. My name is Frank Days. My day job is I run marketing for Tesora. We are the top contributor to the Trove project. That's database as a service here at OpenStack. Um, also, this past year, I had the good fortune, along with Sharon Zitzman on my panel, of organizing the, the first OpenStack Days East event in New York City, a 500-person event. And um, <laughs> one of the things that we do, I think everyone on this panel has organized at least one OpenStack Days event and has learned a lot from it. And we were trying to really share with everyone today the things we all learned. And hopefully, um, you can pick up some interesting information. Just from a, Denise uh, Rodolfo, who's helped all of us in these events from the foundation okay. standpoint. Shout out to Denise. And also, Sri Ram Submarine, who is with the OpenStack Days in Seattle as well. We got pretty crammed in when I was trying to put the proposal in. And next thing you know, I had seven people on the panel. And Sri Ram will be here as a resource as well throughout this. As we look at OpenStack Days events, they really it, this year was this was probably the year of the OpenStack Days events. Twenty-seven events, over twelve thousand people attended one of these events around the world. So, including the China one, which had over 20, 2,400 people. So, a pretty amazing, amazing array of, of events that went on. So, just to quickly to introduce everyone, uh, first of all, uh, Annie Lai, OpenStack Days China event. Uh, Dushan Dordovic is filling in for Haiti of uh, OpenStack Days Ireland. We have Hannah, I'm going to butcher your name, Sulkova from OpenStack Days Prague. And that's in the Czech Republic, not Hungary, as I was reminded before. <laughs> Classic American geography knowledge there. And uh, Sriram, who I introduced from OpenStack Days in Seattle. Uh, Sharon Zitzman, my part, who run, has organized the OpenStack Days Israel and also partner in crime on the OpenStack Days East event. And Martin Kiss, who has probably managed more OpenStack Days events than all of us on this panel combined. <laughs> no, so, no. not quite that, yeah, but I was reminded that he was doing OpenStack Days events before OpenStack Days were cool. So, that's the good thing to know about. So, why don't we just jump into the conversation? This is interactive, so I'm going to come out to you guys periodically. If you have a question, Raise your hand in the middle. We want to make this as interactive as possible. It's a community event about doing community events. So let's don't be afraid to ask questions. So the first question is, and I often ask myself this question a lot while I was in the middle of the planning process, is why? Why on earth would you do one of these events? I'm going to start with Annie. What was the motivation for you guys to do an event? Well, um, I think number one is to um, <coughs> you know, uh, promote OpenStack in the community. And, um, and also, not for China, open source is kind of new. So there's a lot of education. And we want to use the opportunity to kind of promote OpenStack and then educate the Chinese developers and users what open source is about and what OpenStack is about. That was um, our number one goal. Uh, but I'm sure for other regions it might be different. But for China, um, it's our first time. So our focus was mostly on education, promotion, and also community, you know, collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our ma main idea is Ireland is, we are, we are trying to present Ireland as a sm sort of a small Silicon Valley of Europe. Uh, and on the other hand, and we do have relatively big uh, OpenStack uh, community, meetup community, which is almost 600 uh, members now. On the other hand, we don't know much about that community. So that was our main idea. To, uh, to see our community on one side and to meet the community, and on the other side, to present what we are doing in Ireland in sense of OpenStack and, and, and generally cloud, uh, cloud as well. So that was the dri main drive motive, why, why we entered the, the whole thing. OK, so uh, in Prague, or in Czech Republic, there was a problem that uh, the opposite side, that there is uh, no community. So the reason why we decided to organize the event is to build the OpenStack community and to extend the awareness about the open source technologies because we think that's uh, cool and people should know, should know about that. That was the reason. Yeah, so my first summit was in Boston. <laughs> and it was a very long, long time ago. And it was a so good experience that our goal was that I simply wanted to bring the spirit of the summits into Central Europe. And I think we, we definitely reached that goal during the last few years. Um, so 
I'm from Tel Aviv, um, and Israel is a very technologically advanced country. A lot of uh, brilliant developers, engineers, cloud uh, admins, but they're very dispersed, so it was really important for us to kind of bring the community together. Um, we ourselves um, lead an open source proje project and kind of um, build out the open source community um, and specifically around OpenStack, find more contributions uh, to the OpenStack community. We thought that that was a really important driver, so um, we wanted to do that, and we've actually been doing this for a good four years as well. Wow. Um, so, yeah. That's great. So, as we do these events, um, with the question coming back to, I think about my own experience with the OpenStack Days East event. Um, we did, you know, I did this as a part of my day job, right? We were doing an event. We did Trove-centric events the previous two years, and then we decided we would do an OpenStack Days event. And I had to sell the, the event to my CEO and to peers in my company that this would be important and valuable experience for us. Um, but I wanted to get a sense from the panel. Maybe I'll kind of go uh, back to Sharon. We'll start on this end. I mean, how, what was in it for your company, and how did you sort of justify or share or convince people within your company this was an important endeavor? Um, so I think, first of all, the friends and the networking that we've made uh, being um, an active part of the OpenStack community has been invaluable to the company. Um, let's start with that. Um, just kind of being a part of something that's bigger than you, learning about new technologies, integrating, collaborating. This is um, a very important play. There's always um, the very important skill set that's lacking and finding really good uh, developers and engineers and so this is one aspect as well. Um, but there's been a lot in it in terms of just um, kind of connecting to the right opportunities and you know building partnerships and collaborating and um, doing a lot more interesting things with our technology as well. Anyone else want to take that? Or? Yeah, so, so basically what we did, it was a real community event. So it was not an advantage for a single company. We wanted to sell it for the sponsors as a good opportunity con to show up their commitments to the open source and the entire open stack cloud. So basically, it, it was really fantastic that we can do it since the really early days. And, and basically, it was very hard to sell it for, for the, even for the sponsors. So it was not so common that they want to support an open source community because especially in Hungary, we are in a very special situation that uh, most of the companies are just uh, small uh, departments of larger vendors. Great, so how, how big was the event in Budapest? Yeah, in Budapest, I think we started, it was not so big, so Budapest is not a, or Hungary is not a very huge country. We have around 10 million people. But it, for the first event, as I remember, we had around 250. Wow, good size crowds. Still, so it was not so bad for start. Yeah. Okay. Hannah? Uh, yeah, for Prague, we decided to have a small event. Yep. I discussed it with Claire because so we didn't know what we can expect, so we decided for the 150 people. Okay. But uh, the people really was really excited of this event. So for next year, we will have a second OpenStack Day, and it will. I hope so. It will be much more bigger. And from the community point of view, uh, in Prague, it was difficult. So I. All the people in company was really enthusiastic about the organizing, but the, the other companies who likes OpenStack, they want to be uh, sponsors, but not so active in the community. So we <coughs> actually prepared everything as a TCP Cloud or as a yeah. company, but as a co-organizer with OpenStack Foundation yeah. and try to attract other people. But when you were organizing this event, and I may just all three of you guys, I mean, were you organizing it on Day, you know, during your day job as a part of your day job, or was this something you did on nights and weekends? Uh, it's on nights and weekends. Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah. Martin, same thing for you, nights and weekends, or? No, I basically have a very flexible work environment, okay. so I can do it very, very freely, but I sometimes even sleeping, uh, dreaming about this event. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had those it, it, I think it is a very long process because okay. you need to arrange everything yeah. from the start. How about in Ireland in terms of organizing the event? Was it done as a part of your day job or was it something that you did sort of nights and weekends on the spare time? Uh, we, uh, 
from my for our own perspective, we are a small consultancy company, and it's it was natural move for us to to be a part of, of yeah. this kind of, of community. Uh, but I must say that we had actually phenomenal response, uh, and it was not hard sell at all to sponsors and uh, and uh, to community to help us organize the the, the whole event. Uh, the, the people that that were co-organizers, we, uh, mostly we've done uh, we've done it all as as a part of daily job. On the sponsoring side. We, believe it or not, we had to turn away some sponsors. We didn't need that much of money. So it wasn't hard yeah. sell at all. It wasn't hard sell at all to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, actually, we actually set some money aside for... We set some money aside for next year, yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't hard to sell at all. Uh, in terms of size, we didn't know what to expect, and right. we we started with 120 designed. The, we, I mean, took the venue for 120 people. <coughs> uh, we sold out everything. I mean, all 120 place, places. We at the end, and then, and then the whole nightmare started when when I had a call from lady from HP saying, "Look, we have a bus of people coming to your event. Can you send us invoice <laughs> for tickets?" Oh my! <laughs> Literally like that. So at the end, we we ended up with. Squeezing somehow or some, something around 170 people. So the response was, was phenomenal, both from sponsors and from people uh, coming in. And it, it was a really great experience. Let me, let me ask Can Annie I, on this next. I just wanted to uh, comment. Sure, sure, go ahead. In yeah. general, just on that, um, on the other side, because it's a bit of a double edged sword. You're asking if, you know, if you're doing it during your day job. I, I just want to, you know, say that it is something that you need to be all in on. It's not something that you can do halfway. So it isn't just your day job, it's nights and weekends and it's everything, but you have to be deeply committed to doing it because it is something that is resource intensive, but it's really a great, great feeling when you get it together and you're part of something that's larger than you and you see that you're the one that brought out the community, brought people together, building conversations around open source, around something that you deeply believe in. So be aware that there is a, there is an investment and it's not, and you do have to have the mandate, I think, from your job in order to be able to do it because it's not something that, um, it is something you have to be all in on. But um, I'm sure that just the business value and all the values around building this community sell themselves. Um, so if you are um, interested, there are ways to convince um, your organizations that it is something that they should be invested in. Yeah, so let me shift questions here for a second. The, the, obviously, we, so we've kind of moved over to finances, right? Because that's always the big question I imagine that most everyone is, it was the scariest thing for me. I mean, I know we did the OpenStack Days East event. I had to sign a contract for $150,000 for the venue. And um, before we had even sold a sponsorship, or we'd sold like one sponsorship and no tickets. So I mean, that's we should give a shout out to Plum Grid for that. What's that? We should give a shout out to yeah, Plum, Plum Grid. Yeah, Plum Grid, Plum and well, Gigaspaces <laughs> and Tesoro, the three of us kind of <laughs> led the way. But you know, someone has to sign sign that contract depending on what space you have. I mean, how did it work for you guys? I mean, a 2,500, 2,400 person event. How did you and work out the finance? Three months to and in three months, it. I mean, yeah. I can imagine the finance person when you went to that person. I have this vision for an event. I no, need to sign for a twenty-five. We, yeah, we, we, yeah. China is a huge market. And it's the first time we organize <coughs> an OpenStack Day event, and it, it's a very um, complex market too. So we actually, and then we had three months to prepare. So we actually had to set some ground rule in the beginning so we don't get into a chaotic situation because people, it's still it's some education, people need to understand OpenStack Day is a community event. It's not a different from you know other, like conf other conferences, they are more commercial. This is more for community, education, collaboration, promotion of an open source. So we actually made a ground rule that you know, the organizers, the volunteers, this is a grassroots effort and you don't represent companies and companies get visibility by sponsorship only. So even if you're a volunteer, it doesn't give you the right to be on stage and talk about your company. So we made that ground rule. So all mm -hmm. the volunteers were really volunteers and because of that, we'll use our personal time. So we're not gonna get like big kudo from our boss say, oh yeah, you did this, right? But we do this truly for the benefit of the community. So for me, because it was only three months and um, so we, we had to do like, things like in a very, um, it was a last minute thing, so, but we didn't have any company who's willing to write a big check up front, 
right? And because, w but then at the same time, we have to secure a venue because right. we're thinking we might have a couple thousand people because we try to use Japan as a benchmark. And we're thinking about Japan, they always have a thousand people, a couple, few thousand people. So we use that as a benchmark. So we had to get a large conference room secure, but we didn't have any company who's willing to write that check. Because what if we don't sell all the seeds and we don't sell sponsorship, but then we already got the venue, what do we do? <laughs> So we actually found this worked out really well for us. We found a media company, and we invite them to be a volunteer as well. So you come in, and they, they had some understanding of OpenStack. And they come in, and you work with us. And in exchange, you will get some visibility because you were part of the you know volunteering team. And so we got lucky, and we found <coughs> this company. And um, so they, they were willing to write up this check and then because we feel like this is a community thing and the rest of us, we work very hard to get all the sponsorships to make sure that they don't lose money in the end. And so they wrote this check, secure the venue at the China's largest conference center, <laughs> you know, yeah. national conference center in Beijing. <laughs> so we got really lucky. We have a first class venue and this media company wrote a check to secure and then you know we, we came up with this event plan and the sponsorship plan, and then immediately we we saw the sponsorship so fast. I mean, there's yeah. more people wanting to sponsor. I mean, in the end, we got all this. Uh, we, we were able to sell all the sponsorships in probably three weeks. So, so it's a different market. China yeah. is a little bit different. Yeah. Dushan, so your your event was probably on the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Small consulting company. Uh, more, even more of a grassroots. How big was the event? Uh, we started, it was one, well, around 170 people. 170 people. Yeah. I mean, when you built your financial plan, how did you, you know, secure a venue, you know, build the financial model that you end up with a surplus that's great, but there must have been a point in all our planning process where you got to put the money out for the venue, you got to commit to food, you know, the spending goes like this, and then the sponsorships come in and you get back to break even. Who backstopped your event? Who guaranteed you know the event? Yes. Yeah, so well, we, we've been in a good position because first of all, uh, our foundation have helped us a lot, OpenStack Foundation. Mm -hmm. So that was the big, very big help for to, to start it both with some finance, but also with with knowledge how to do things. Uh, then it's. Uh, uh, the the other backers the other uh, uh, the Heidi who, who is not here she's from from Intel so Intel okay. was great help so we we had some some of a good background to put it that way so we had a couple of big companies uh, we had some money and the costs are not that high uh, at least in Ireland so of course venue costs a lot but it's it's not it, it wouldn't be significant yeah. loss even if we even if we missed for for a large amount. Of, of of numbers, so we we just we like by, by the started and and uh, we hoped for the best to put it that way. So can I go off the board here to Seattle because I know you've done your event twice already and you've done it. You do it at W Hotel. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So thank you. So I'm Sri Ram. I'm basically yeah. from Seattle, right? So I did it twice, and um, we started a little uh, small. We wanted we targeted 150 attendees the first year, but we oversold and we got about 175. And the second year we wanted to target 175. We oversold. We got I mean we we got sold out and we we, we got 200. Uh, we changed the venues. Uh, we had a smaller venue, kind of a niche, kind of a high-end venue for the first one, and. Someone had a feedback saying that this doesn't sound like an open source kind of event. It's kind of high end, but then um, we wanted to get a larger event, so we went to the W Hotel. Um, the the risk was uh, like you know uh, I'm we are a small company and uh, there was always a possibility of losing money. So what my right. take was you know it might sound kind of. Uh, um, Go with the intent that it's you are doing for the community. There's always the possibility of losing money. That's that's the reality. Right. Being an event organizer, but however, you know, in both cases, uh, I didn't have to end up. I mean, we didn't have to uh, lose money. We we broke even and we even made some like you know uh, extra cash. So, the 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 point I'm trying to make here is, 
these events, just this kind of events you're doing for the community, the sponsors might have you know, different aspirations, right? Like, you no, know, they want to show their support. However, they want to have a marketing, uh, something value out of it, right? So that's their goal. But as an organizer, you cannot have the goal. You need to, you are doing it for the community and be prepared to take the risk, like be, be, be prepared to lose money on that. But I don't think you will lose money out of it. You will definitely like, you know, um, yeah. yeah. Kavit has a point. Uh, so, I think uh, we've done we've done about four uh, four in India in thus India? far, okay. and we've gone from like hundred people to seven hundred this time. Wow, that's a pretty uh, good number. The biggest problem we faced was there is a sweet spot where uh, going to a hotel with catering pre-provided is financially viable, and then once you cross to fifty three hundred, it just becomes impossible to match those. The venues are very expensive. Yeah. We had that same challenge in yeah, New York. So the, the cost of a 200, there's a cat, large number of venues that'll get you to like 150 or 200 people. Yeah, when you get to that next strata. It's very difficult, right? So this time we got a hall with around 900 seats and wow. we only had 700 attendees, but we were only targeting 600. We oversold, but it looked like we had undersold because there was like 200 seats. A lot seats. of spaces. Yeah. yeah, but we couldn't actually do 900 because the catering costs were kind of shooting shooting out, right? Because not a lot of caterers will come and say, all right, we'll do 1,000 covers on, say, 5% deposit. Like, it's just, it just doesn't happen. So there is a sweet spot where you've got to look, look for the payment cycles from sponsors. Might be 90 days, might be 120 days. And when you have to make the payment, right? So balancing that is a, is a juggling act. But in your case, I mean, say, I hate to say, say you came up short, right? I mean, who was ultimately on the hook? Who signed the contract with the I caterer? I did personally. Sorry? I did personally. Like, personally, yeah. yeah so, yeah. I mean, that's always a risk. Yeah, yeah. but I've, I've, I've done four of these. I know, I mean, yep. the way I price the tickets and the way it happens, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I knew I wouldn't have a shortfall. Yep. Like, that's not an issue. Uh, it's, it's just making sure that the people who attend have the right resources, right? Yep. You don't want people to... Sit, sit there hungry or not have decent food, right? So, this. Yeah. yeah. Um, my experience from Prague is that uh, you should start with a simple analysis. So what I did, that I know the number of people who will be at the event, yep. and then I set uh, main parts of the expense. So it was the venue for the rent, it was the catering because people love eating, and it was the sounds and light production. And then I add some uh, small expenses what I need for the promotion, for the swag. So I did a list, and then I know that how much money I need from the sponsors, and then I right. started to calculate it. That but the reality of the situation is that the room and the food are what, 80, some 80 to 90% of all your expenses, so right? I, I can, yeah. okay, so we've, uh, I've been doing it for a few years, um, and we started small, we started uh, you know, in, in a humble kind of setting. There are um, different kinds of ways to, to find um, ways to you know, lower the costs. We've historically worked with universities. Um, we've found venue sponsors. There, we have big organizations in Israel like HP and Microsoft and Red Hat who have their own um, auditoriums and who are willing to be the venue sponsor. Sometimes this includes food, sometimes this doesn't include food, and they get a higher level sponsorship um, for doing this. So these are ways maybe to um, downsize the risks of you know, signing on a major venue. Uh, maybe you have a community um, you know, sponsor who's willing to provide a space Base, who's willing to provide some aspect of yeah. the food, something that will help you budget-wise so you don't take as big of a risk. Um, to, to work with universities, possibly um, you know, provide free entrance to students, things like that, and then they'll offer you an auditorium within you know, the university. We've done things like that historically, and, and Claire can vouch for our historical, you know, uh, in, We've had this evolution of going from smaller scale events and having you know falafel at events to having uh, you know yeah. better catering and better venues. So as soon as the event starts to drive itself and you build a community and you and you have really good content and you show that the event is you know worthwhile, the sponsors will come. But if you're starting small, then start try and work with you know sp like venue sponsors, community sponsors, university yeah. sponsors that can help you with the larger parts of the budget. So let me ask you a different part of the budget question. Oh, Oh, sorry, do we have a question from the back? Yeah, I just wanted to, you, you asked earlier about who, who in the end pays. 
Yeah. Uh, and I just want to share how we did this in Germany for the last two Great, years. Great, yeah, when please we, do. When we took this out of corporate sponsorship, so we now run it as a community event only, although we do have day jobs, but it's run from the community. And the initial event, what she had to cover, we went into risk with personal funds. So we had to, the, the, there's, a, there's a gap to you get the money, yeah. right? and, and you, you pay the venue. Right. So we, we, we took out a loan, and uh, a loan. we never needed it. Uh, ever, but it was uh, the risk was with the with the with the group. The group, but st who signed the loan paper? I guess <laughs> the, um, the um, we incorporated as a, as a. As a oh, as okay, a, that's interesting. And, um, and it sounds much bigger than it is under German law. Wow. Um, and so the the president signed. Uh, yes. I can also say that I've seen, um, well, at least this has been done in Israel, where um, they've crowdsourced uh, from the community, you know, a smaller fee, um, where they asked in advance uh, for smaller developer events, you know, every developer, you know, contribute five, ten dollars, and, and this has worked sometimes uh, for smaller events, obviously, but that's also an option. You can also try and crowdsource the funds yeah. from the community if they really believe in the event. Yeah, and just uh, in France, we do, uh, as in Germany, it seems that we have a um, non-profit organization, legal organization, that is independent of um, the different companies who are sponsors, and it's this organization that signs the contract with the venue and that uh, handles all the money, collects the money from the sponsors and uh, pays the, the venue. So in the end, it's still individuals who are responsible for, um, in case there is a, an issue, uh, we, if we don't have enough sponsors, so in that case, the, the president, it's Aaron. <laughs> but, yeah. but well, uh, at least um, the organization is really independent yeah. of any specific company. Uh, and it's maybe it's a, a, a risk as well, because if it fails, we have no uh, company who will pay for us. So we are. So you stiff the venue. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. So let me, let me ask a slightly, go, go ahead. One thing that we, we did and we found success was, you know, there are venues which you don't have to pay up front. It's not always possible, but there are, I mean, at least in Seattle, we were able to find it, right? You, uh, they might have like a, a credit card plan, for instance, or some kind of uh, um, uh, plans they have, where you, you, you have to pay a part of your uh, estimated budget as a, as a deposit, like 10%, for instance, which is more affordable than your estimated budget of 50K or 100K, right? And then, uh, and then you have a time of like 30 days or 45 days after the receipt. And that kind of really works well when, when, when you're dealing with larger sponsors who have net 30 or net 45 yep. days. So you won't get the money in until the event has happened and 30 days have passed the event, right? So, so always look for those. There are venues that are available, um, maybe not in your city, but look for them out. And then if they're available, make use of that. Yeah, and there's also opportunities if you think about venues. And I discovered this. We had signed in Times Square in New York City. It's probably one of the highest rent places you could do an event. And that ended up being ridiculously expensive. But as we get, after I signed the contract, I had one sponsor say, gee, we have a 300-person space they would have given us in New York, like 10 blocks south, for free. Uh, if we, but we would, were going for a bigger event. The point is that if you were determined in year one not to take big financial risk, if you can find a university or a company that has a space that they'll lend, let you use for free, that, getting rid of that venue cost, that's 60 to 70% of your budget is the venue. If you can eliminate that cost, that, then the only risk you have is food, which it's, is... I think, I think uh, you can also fund. Yeah. You can also. For yeah. example, there are a lot in Bangalore, for example, right? There, there, there's an event every weekend. Like, even when we did the OpenStack in LA last year, there was a Docker event. And we, uh, lost, um, we lost like 10% of the people okay. who paid for our event but ended up going there. So you have to now offer something more than just talks. Right? Right. So we are next, next year we are thinking of doing like hands-on training, uh, upstream training, right, at the India Day for people who can't come to the summit. But to do that, we can't now just go to an event that has seats. We now yeah. need breakout and rooms and yeah, yeah. We yeah. Need internet, right? Yeah. So, so the scope has kind of expanded just to remain competitive because there's just so much other stuff going on every every weekend. Yeah. Uh, it's it's we have to take on more, but it's yeah. just 
difficult to find a model that would scale. So let me ask a different, slightly different question. This is the question that we all face when we're planning these events is, is pricing. And you know, I know Denise had given me some good guidance around tickets. I know the foundation was encouraging us to keep the tickets cheap. But then you have to build a budget. You need to, you know, you start to build like I have these costs and then I have revenue and then I've got to kind of make sure the two meet in the middle. Martin, can you share a little bit about, you know, your how you got to, you know, where you got you've done a few of these. Yeah, exactly. I think we definitely tried different uh, business models for tickets. So in one year we we got some minimal fee, in the other we tried the free tickets model. But it is a really cultural thing because in Central Europe, if someone is not paying for a ticket, then it have a higher chance that they are not showing up. Yeah, that's, the, that's universal, I think. Yeah, but yeah. universal, but, definitely. But, but <laughs> at, the, at the other end, if, if we need to ask money for the ticket, that we need to be compliant with the local laws. And in Hungary, we have the highest uh, value-added tax in the ent entire Europe. How much does that 27%. work out? 27%. How, how much is it? 27%. That's how they Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so it, it's, it's really a pain, and we need to give invoices, so we need to solve the invoicing, and it is, uh, we usually using Eventbrite for registration. So you lose your and five points, not, yeah, not five percent. And it is not a fun to yeah. integrate with the... So how about sponsorship pricing? How did you get to what you priced your sponsorships at for your event? Yeah, yeah basically for sponsorship, I think uh, we are in a very good position because we can estimate the cost. And we are trying uh, to divide the costs between the different sponsorship packages. Okay. Uh, we, in, in Ireland, the, the event was not, it, it was excused from VAT because it's sort of an educational event. So okay. we didn't have to charge the VAT. So that's definitely something that you should ask in your country, can you be excused from, from VAT for educational purposes? Uh, uh, we, I think that we priced our, I, I was scared because we had to price tickets relatively high and I, I was scared that it is going to turn people away, especially right. because it is the first, uh, uh, the first event. But at the end it, it worked fine, as I said, we, we, we oversold, oversold the ticket. But speaking of, of money uh, generally, uh, I think that the, it's, it's very valuable to have sponsors not only for money, but there's, there are a lot of things that, that, that needs to be done and we are all part of the community, so I am not professional, I'm an I'm IT guy, I'm not someone who organizes the events on, on daily basis. So you need to do marketing, you need to, uh, you need to invite people, you need to do a lot of things that you generally don't know how. So that's why I think it's yeah. very valuable to have, uh, to have uh, sponsors, not only to give you money, but also to provide you their own network. Believe it or not, we had a minister from government visiting our, our event. So it was th th organized in that way, so, and that's something M mainly thank, uh, thanks to, 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 to sponsors and their network. So, Annie, give me a sense. In, in China, I mean, when you built your financial model for your event, how did you come up with price of sponsorships, price of tickets, things like that? Yeah, I think, I, I think first you need to understand your market, your region, right? Mm -hmm. So, at that point, we, we, we knew there's a pent up demand for OpenStack Day because we never had one and we never even had an OpenStack Summit in China. At the same time, China's got the number two highest num number of developers, OpenStack developers. So we know we can sell sponsorships. And um, so, and our goal is to get as many people in as possible. So everybody, because not many people in China, especially developers can travel. And also sometimes getting visa for them um, in a foreign country is very challenging. So our goal is to be inclusive, in, you know, we want to make sure that they can get to the event easily. So in that case, we decided to put the burden on sponsorships, right? So our event, our ticket was only like 60 or I think 60 USD, okay. US dollars. It's very cheap. And, and then we also had, you know, lunch too. But we did uh, have, we had uh, about 30 plus sponsorship. We had diamond sponsorship, you know, so, uh, diamond, gold, silver, you know, tiered sponsorship. And then we sell all kinds of stuff, water bottle sponsorship. Yeah. And in China, this is funny. This is where we, it's, it's apparently this is common in China. You can sell, put a company's logo in the back of a chair of the seat. <laughs> <laughs> And you can wow. sell that as a sponsorship because why companies buy that? Because when they take picture from the back, they see their logos everywhere. And we charge a lot for that. That's a good idea. <laughs> and, and, then, and then, but then the other company wanted that too. 
we're like, okay, we'll divide the room into half and half. <laughs> so in that case, it doesn't look like it's a one company's event, right? Because we don't want people to think this is one company's dominated event, but at the same time, we, <laughs> we need the sponsorship money, right? So in the end, we decided to have like three options for three companies to buy that thing. And so we do have um, high price items for, yeah. for that, you know, for more visibility. <laughs> And you just have to be creative. Sell whatever you can sell. So the, so the question is two philosophies. Let me just ask one, one more question, then we'll take the question back here. There's two philosophies about pricing, right? There's keep it cheap and sell a lot of it, or there's you know price it high. Because I, I have my second, my day job is I run marketing for a company that gets solicited by people like you guys who have events that want its sponsors, <laughs> right? You know, I, that's one role is my day job. I see them come across. And then there's my other role, managing an OpenStack Days events. How do you, I guess this question is Sharon, how do you balance the, do you go cheap, cheap and cheerful and try and sell out? Or do you go, you know, high value? Because, I mean, look, I mean, it's, a, I want to say, what was it, $175 or $200,000 for those four big booths right. on the floor downstairs? I mean, there is a precedent in the community for higher priced stuff as well. Okay. I mean, what's the right way to find that balance? So first and foremost, what, Anne, um, what Hannah said. So, she, so you have to reverse engineer your budget. We're not looking to make any profit. We're looking to break even. Um, so that's first and foremost. So based on the amount of money that we need to bring in, uh, we historically actually didn't want to charge for tickets, but we found the same thing with uh, Martin, that um, if somebody doesn't pay for their ticket, they respect the event less, and we had more, more no-shows. So our fee, in a sense, is what we call a seriousness fee. It's, uh, it's a phrase in Hebrew, just to make sure that people will show up. Um, we want um, to obviously attract you know, early people. We'll, we want to give them the uh, incentive of buying early tickets, so we have the earlier, early bird pricing. But we found in Israel, at least, because uh, they're procrastinators. Um, <coughs> and then you also have to give the venue you know, an estimate of the amount of people that are coming, things like that. We decided to have um, a late... Um, Late uh, a fee in that uh, we added like a um, sort of looking for a for convenience we, we char charge. Uh, yes, an, an extra charge. <laughs> we created an extra charge for late fees um, because we found that people would like or uh, would sell out in the last week, and we wanted to incentivize people to to buy tickets earlier. So we created all kinds of you know. Um, discounts, things like that throughout you know, the selling period. We had the early bird, we had discounts, and then we also have a late charge fee so that people in the last week don't you know, purchase the, the large bulk of the tickets. We want to make sure people buy tickets earlier so we have a really good estimate. Um, and based on the amount of tickets that we know we're likely going to sell, we price this sponsorship in, in you know, the same manner. And then we also create all kinds of add-ons um, to enable people to, um, you know, if they want to hire visibility of sponsorship, um, so we enable them to, you know, take a podcast okay. or a meetup, and that's something that we have the luxury to do because we run those uh, kinds of community initiatives as well. Um, but we try to keep it as low as possible based on the budget that we think that we're going to be expending. So we had a question in the back. Let's bring it in. Um, what about sourcing content, speakers? That was the next question I was just going to ask. Do you want to? You can, go ahead. Yeah, good, good question. How can we talk? Can we talk? Before you answer the question, I had one point about sure. the sponsors. So, so the way that we, I, I see this, like, you know, when you plan your uh, budgeting, say, like, you have 100K, for instance, right? Like, try to get that 100K, most of it from your sponsors, like your bulk sponsors, like Platinum 25% or, like, three or four gold sponsors. And uh, I would not expect to cover a lot of, lot of the expenses through the tickets. The ticketing is primarily like you know like the seriousness fee, right? Say like 10%. Try to get the 10% of the uh, your budgeting f to the tickets. Uh, that's think like more like an overflow, if at all, right? And and be prepared to give away half of it. Like you know, for instance, we had a diversity scholarships, so to encourage more participation, right? Those kind of things. If you if you uh, plan for that one, you have the more liberty of like you know encouraging more participation, giving scholarship for students or things like that, or invited speakers, things like that, right? So, plan to cover your budget or vast majority of your through your bulk sponsors. That way, like you know, your your bases are covered. And then try to have the add-ons like your cocktail sponsors or your lunch sponsors or like you know the chair sponsor or something like that. Those are all like think like you know your surplus. So that that way like we, that that really worked out well. And uh, the other thing uh, about the um, sponsorships that my my personal uh, favorite is like you know give the opportunity to the startups in the com community. Like you know it is good to give them visibility as good as like a 
silver sponsors, for instance. Obviously, like you cannot give the same visibility as the platinum, but try to give like like try to charge them very little. Like for instance, the platinum was 15k, for instance, for us, and the startup was like 2k. However, like the, the 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 startup sponsors got the same blogging opportunity, video interview opportunity, a small size logo, uh, not the large size logo, but small size logo on that. So that kind of encourages the the smaller sponsors, right. uh, but your your base is still covered. So that that. Think, of, think like that. So I don't mean to cut you off, Shriram. I got like one last question here because we're coming right up against over time. And the question is, how do we get speakers? We talked about money, which is always important, but if you want to start down with, uh, how about Hannah? Do you want to give us a sense of how you? Yeah, sure. So uh, in Prague, we decided to have uh, keynotes. And for luckily, we have uh, OpenStack Foundation there. So mm -hmm. for, for the speakers, for the keynotes, we have the OpenStack Foundation, Mark Lear, and then we want to have some more technical presentations. So we had on the website called for presentation, and we had a really technical presentation. And because of budget, we offer for the sponsors to have uh, speakers there. But there was the real requirement not to do vendor presentation. And I'm really happy that they understand. And uh, they, the presentation was really professional and no vendors. So okay. yes, you are the community. So you need to have uh, no vendor presentation. Say, Annie, can you share how you ended up with Sourcing your speakers? I, I think it has to be a balance. We definitely need some representation from, you know, the top experts and then leadership from the foundation because people in, for example, in China, right? They want to, especially the ones who's never been to the summit. They want to really meet those top leaders. So it's important that you know people. We come to the summit. We build up our network, and and try to entice them to come to your region and speak. Especially those PTLs or TCs, and or sometimes board directors too or foundation staff. And but at the same time, I do think it's important to also have your regional experts there and in regional customers. Like for our keynote, we make sure that we have customer cases because people want to hear from customers directly, yeah. not from vendors. So it's a balance. So we we actually had. You know, pretty good, especially for the keynote, the first morning of the event. We had p leadership from the foundation and then also customer, senior level customers. Great. I'm, we're going to get yanked wanna, off the stage in just I a moment. Just so make one comment there that I think that the OpenStack Foundation has taken huge strides in assisting in this uh, matter. And they, they've created the Speaker Bureau, um, which is a lot of the higher profile OpenStack speakers and uh, the people that are willing to travel and the places they're willing to travel to historically used to have to see those sponsors, or, uh, those speakers yourself. So um, they've facilitated that. They've made it a lot easier. Um, the OpenStack uh, Foundation folks oftentimes come to many of the day events around the world. They uh, re rearrange their schedules and they make it work and they really try to support all of the events. So you have a really, really good resource in the foundation. I really am giving you guys a shout out. I think you guys are wonderful. Um, you've done a lot over the course of the years to add support and help uh, make them work, make the events work. So definitely uh, speak to the foundation if you're looking to put together a day event. Um, they will help you. They will help you connect to people that want to come out. They've done that with us uh, historically before the Speaker Bureau. They told us, okay, this person is interested, that person is interested. Um, right. So, yeah, so let's do this. Let's you. just last because we're five minutes over. So, do you, you want to, yeah, last, to, last one. And yeah, then we'll last one. Uh, I agreed here. So it's it's a very good thing to have a balance between vendors and their own talks uh, and, and community. Uh, what our driving motive was to represent Ireland, what is happening in Ireland mm -hmm. regarding to OpenStack, what, what I was doing and what my colleagues or co were doing, that we actually phoned people. So we know the community, we know what is going on. So I was phoning people, I was sending emails, tweets, and asking them, look, we have the event, so put your talk up there so we can see what you're doing. Great, thanks. Well, everybody, thank you for uh, joining us. If, if you have any questions, I think the group of us are going to be hanging around here or over. Or we're all certainly all available through the regular channels. There's the channels. mailing list. There's the community mailing list. You can ask questions yeah, there. I mean, Denise connects everybody as well. Um, definitely get involved. There's the OpenStack Slack and the Facebook group and a bunch of places that um, people are trying to connect and co collaborate and communicate. And uh, there are a lot of really good resources out there that will yeah. want to help you. And just a Thanks. shout out to Hannah and Haiti who are doing a, a book an ebook. Awesome. Just a quick. Congrats. Yeah, we expect that the guide will be issued in November. Yeah. yeah congrats. It's all about planning yeah. your first. And the, all these questions you have there, uh, we hope they be answered. I had a chance to <laughs> I had a chance to preview, and it's pretty excellent and exhaustive. I think it's like 70 pages. Sure. And thanks to to foundation. Uh, 
I know that foundation is very adamant about using the logo, but it was painted in green for Ireland. Yeah. Because it's Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys.